This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 887, recorded on Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. Vlogs, dogs, or science? Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your head with meat, heat, and sleep. But first, thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. When looking around at the world today, all the global warming, global wars, global poxes, it's important to remember it's going to be okay. Not everything is going to be okay, of course, but a lot of things, most definitely, well, okay, are not going to be okay. People are getting hurt out there, but some things, things you might not have even thought about as important before realizing, hey, that's not broken yet. That thing is going to be okay. While waiting for the next terrible thing to happen, whatever the next terrible thing uh, might be, re remember the old saying. doesn't matter which old saying. I don't even know any myself. Just pick one. It's good. It's fine. It'll do. Get you through. Remember when we used to joke? about monkeypox on the show? Oh, yeah. Because it was funny sounding, obscure, improbable, a thing that could never really have a global impact until <laughs> now. And so now we're, we're out of terrible guesses. That was the last one. What happens next we, we, we is beyond compare. In fact, never mind that it's going to be okay and the old sayings, that sort of thinking never works itself out the way you want it to anyway. Instead, Consider what it is you can get involved with in solutions. Life goes by faster than you think it will. Now is the moment in which you can do things. So go do them. Make an impact. Some solutions might require science. So go be a scientist. Others might require legal action. So go be a lawyer. Some solutions may require you to work for a noble nonprofit cause. So pick one. And if the noble cause that you fall in love with isn't out there, Start it. You will be ready for the next thing the world throws at us because thank goodness for you. And this week in science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again, as we are every week, to talk about science news. We do love it so much. And I would also like to wish everyone a happy day of lazily spoiling your dogs while vlogging. Huh? What? Yeah, well, if you look on what national day it is today, apparently on the list, well, there are many actual, today is a day of many things, but today was the day of, national day of being lazy, vlogging, and dog spoiling. Well, so, you Blair, know, my, that, my favorite you better all that dog. stuff I just said about doing something. It seems like a... <laughs> Nope, not today. Not, not today. today. <laughs> my my favorite holiday was just a couple days ago. I hope everyone celebrated National Sneak a Zucchini onto your neighbor's porch day. And did you? I don't none of my neighbors have porches. <laughs> <laughs> so also I would not be caught dead buying a zucchini fleck. But anyway, you're supposed to buy what? the zucchini. You're supposed to grow the zucchini. Have I know. I don't too many know. zucchini, why and then buy, have to Why would you them. buy zucchini? I don't understand. <laughs> because people give them to you, so you don't need to buy them. Yeah. No, no and not appeared on my on my front front stoop. I was very disappointed. Oh well, you don't. You didn't want one anyway. No, I would. Like... I would regift it. You see, I would pass it along. <laughs> 
That's, is there a national, is, national is the day after day. national sneak a zucchini day is it national re-gift a zucchini day national sneak a zucchini into your neighbor's mailbox day <laughs> sometimes i feel like the adults are talking in euphemisms <laughs> and i'm just like don't get it i don't know let's talk about science so yeah. What do I have tonight? I have stories about, let's see, leak, leak, not leaking, linking Uh-oh. your gut to your heart, restoring mm. hearing, uh, impacts that foods have, and a few aging stories. One specifically for you, Blair. Justin, what do you have? I've got rewilding the West, new home on the range. Why you should never catch a raindrop on your tongue. And uh, a little Arctic, Antarctic uh, ice update came came in. Uh, Nice. You can probably imagine what that one is. That there's lots of it? No. Uh, Okay. I don't think Uh, so. (laughs) Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh, I have a nice, light, fun animal corner today filled with cancer-sniffing locusts, uh, sleepy spiders, and rat sperm. So uh, it's going to be real fun. <laughs> All over the place. That's mm-hmm. going to be great. Well, as we dive into our science show tonight, I would love to remind everyone that if you're not yet subscribed, you can find us This Week in Science on all podcast platforms. Well, pretty much all of them. Just look for This Week in Science. You can also find us broadcasting live weekly on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. We are, uh, let's see, that's that's Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Pacific time. And if you look for us on Twitch, Instagram, and Twitter, we are Twist Science. That's how you find us. But if all this is complicated, I mean, I can't even remember all of it. Go to twist.org. It's our website. It's where you find all sorts of information about the show. Now that that's done, everyone click that subscribe, that like, and let's move on to the science. Okay. Why is eating red meat bad for your heart? Why is a raven like a writing desk? Is what you're asking, right? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Something about the... No, that's not right. I was going to say cholesterol. That's wrong. I don't know. know You have all those sayings and you have no idea what they mean. (laughs) I know what that... That's from Alice Wonderland. Please. Come on. Uh... Don't insult me with that. (sighs) All right, so the mechanisms of cardiovascular disease and those specifically that stem from eating red meat and other animal proteins are hotly debated. One of the things, like you said, Blair, cholesterol is high on the list for most people. And we know not that meat consumption doesn't necessarily have all the cholesterol in it that's going to lead to bad cholesterol if you're eating lots of red meat. So there's got to be other stuff going on there. So researchers have been investigating this connection. And this particular paper published in the journal Arteriosclerosis, Thrombosis, and Vascular Biology by researchers at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University and Cleveland Clinic Learner Research Institute quantified the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease associated with meat intake. And they found three pathways that might help explain the risk. They looked at 4,000 U.S. men and women over the age of 65. And as we know, higher meat consumption is linked to higher risk of this kind of cardiovascular disease. 22% higher risk for about every 1.1 1.1 servings of red meat per day. So they also determined that this is uh, elevated, about 10% of it is elevated by increased levels of metabolites produced by gut bacteria from nutrients that are found in the meat. And this is the relationship because red meat has certain nutrients that poultry, eggs, and fish do not. And so gut bacteria can 
explain part of this uh, this increase in risk. So they found that the gut microbiome generated trimethylamine N oxide, also known as TMAO, and other intermediates, gamma butyrobetane and chrono crotonobetane. These are derived from L-carnitine, which is very, very abundant in red meat. So anyway, these particular nutrients, L-carnitine, gets devoured by the bacteria. The bacteria then create these, in, these other metabolites. The metabolites then affect the cardiovascular system and will also change um, other things. They did find, however, the associated risk of meat intake was affected by blood glucose and insulin and for, proce for processed meats, systematic inflammation, but not by blood pressure or blood cholesterol levels. And so they're saying cholesterol actually isn't as highly in involved in this as they previously thought. And what's happening is that if you already are predisposed to inflammation, that your risk for cardiovascular disease due to the conversion of the nutrients into these compounds by your gut bacteria is higher. If you have a lower inflammation profile, your risk of uh, developing cardiovascular disease is also going to be lower. And the same goes for how your insulin and blood glucose levels are standing. So cholesterol may not be so much of the issue, but it might be more your microbiome. It's always the wow. gut, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's 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 one thing that every almost everything that we've known for the past century about nutrition kind of went out the window yeah. once we learned what the gut microbiome was doing and how individually uh, different people are going to be taking up or not utilizing components of what they eat. Now, now heart disease and cholesterol are getting uncoupled by, by uh, yeah. Well, not completely uncoupled, but in no, this no, particular but case for red meat specifically, yeah. 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 It's like whoa. The, now it's now now our knowledge this because this is this is also crazy because this is an, an almost like an entirely new field. Call yeah. it ten years. Call it ten years that we've even had a focus on this, and now we're finding connections uh, throughout human health that we, we didn't know existed and had other conclusions or had other, you know, top suspects on the list. And now uh, it's like, it's like a, it's like a constant episode of cold case almost. Oh, it turns out, remember that, uh, out. that criminal yeah. that we threw, put in pr prison for uh, life uh, for all those terrible crimes. Wasn't eh, the nothing to do with it. <laughs> criminal after all. <laughs> no. But we found the right one this time. Oh gosh, I hope so. Well, but learning more is better because it can allow people to make better choices. You know, if you're more prone to inflammation, oh, choose yeah. to eat red meat less often, processed meat less often. If you are, you know, completely inflammation free, I don't know. Have at it. Enjoy your red meat. Love that. Also, who are you and how do you live? <laughs> no stress, no inflammation. You're not alive. You never yeah. have enough this stomach. How dare you? <laughs> Are you a superhero? Right. Ah, well, I, <laughs> What's I wouldn't What's your superpower? Zero inflammation. Oh, my no. God. <laughs> well, that yeah. wouldn't be good. I either. don't experience any of that. That's all like foreign words to me. So I'm, I'm right there. Yikes. Yeah, well, speaking of criminals, there's one that's been caught in the rain. Justin, tell me about it. You don't want to hear this story. I know. I'm, I'm, I you love just, singing just and don't. gargling in the rain, but I won't do that anymore. Right, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm stalling because my thing is taking too long. Running. So, so okay, this is uh this is Swedish researchers, University of uh, Stockholm. The scientists there decided to look at PFAS water contamination on the planet uh, Earth, which is it's the planet that we're living on. So that's important. PFAS or per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, aka forever chemicals, because they take a really, really, really long time to break down. And worse, they we've inundated the air, water, soil, livestock, everything has got this. If you do uh, blood tests, 
of people and check for PFAS chemical, it's in the majority of blood tests. It's it's in everyone's blood. It's everywhere, regardless of where you are, regardless of age. So eventually they will work their way out of the body over about a four-year period. But the problem is they accumulate in the body as you come into contact with the chemical, which is, again, everywhere in our environment. So you need to uh, avoid them entirely to not have them, which is hard. So according to, this is according to CDC, just a little bit more backstory. PFAS chemical is commonly found in grease-resistant paper, fast food containers and wrappers, microwave popcorn bags, pizza boxes, candy wrappers, stain-resistant coatings used on carpets, upholstery, and other fabrics, water-resistant clothing, cleaning products, personal care products like shampoo and dental floss, and cosmetics, nail polish, eye makeup, paints, varnishes, sealants, and most famously, perhaps, non-stick cookware. The Swedish research team specifically looked for PFAS chemicals in the least likely place possible, sort of as to, to get like a base level of here's what the maybe environment looks like without PFAS chemicals. They looked at rainwater. And while PFAS was detected in rainwater everywhere they looked, including Antarctica and the Tibetan Plateau, Rainwater collected in Antarctica and at the Tibetan Plateau only exceeded the U.S. safe drinking water guidelines by 14 times, making it some of the cleanest unsafe water to drink on the planet. So rainwater everywhere on the planet, unsafe to drink. So those people living off the grid collecting rainwater to drink, still bad. <laughs> it's still, it's because it's gone, it's, it's yes. everywhere. So this is according to Eden Cousins, lead author of the study, which is published in Environmental Science and Technology. Uh, according to some to some studies, exposure can also lead to problems of fertility, developmental delays in children, increased risks of obesity, certain cancers, prostate, kidney, testicular. There was, I think, a thing out there right now, a study talking about liver cancer connection to PFAS. Increases in cholesterol levels, which I guess we don't have to worry about anymore. <laughs> Cousin said that PFASs were now so persistent and ubiquitous that they will never disappear from the planet. This is quoting, we have made the planet inhospitable to human life by irreversibly contaminating it now so that nothing is clean anymore. And to the point that it's not clean enough to be safe. That's a heck of a quote, isn't it? We have crossed the planetary boundary, he says, Yikes. referring to a central paradigm for evaluating Earth's capacity to absorb the impact of human activity. However, Cousins notes that PFAS levels in people have actually dropped quite significantly in the past 20 years, and ambient levels uh, in, the, in the environment have been the same for the past 20 years. So we... I think I think that kind of maybe indicates a a a, a halting or an attempt to avoid using them. Uh, certainly, like there was the big Teflon, which was made with these chemicals, which was nonstick pans, which that were heated, which was the chemical industry when they first were coming up with these was like, oh, they're perfectly safe as long as you don't heat them. And then they well, made, as long as you don't heat them pans. really hot. Heating is then fine. Scratching and pan. overheating is banned. Yeah. Don't use well, your frying pan it, for frying. And you may still have PFAS type chemicals on your nonstick. They got rid of Teflon specific chemical, but then they altered chemical so that it can not be. Uh, anyway, they banned a chemical and then they created a version of it that's probably just as unsafe to put in nonstick. But then again, who wants sticky pans? Am I right? Isn't so what, right? I, what I'm hearing, Justin, is that if we cut PFOS out of Completely. the supply chain, yeah. in four years, we'd be looking a lot better. In four years, uh, well, anything our, that our, you, our bodies would be looking better. What, our bodies would, would drop in PFAS. However, if it's everywhere in the environment, if it's in the water, if it's in rainwater, which means it's in the circulatory water system, and it's not disappearing from that, then we're going to keep on getting it back in us and accumulating. So this is like the trick. Like it's going to be forever. But 
So here's here's the, the silver lining in all this. This is the same research is quoted here saying, I'm not super concerned about the everyday exposure in mountain or stream water or in the food. We can't escape it. We're just going to have to live with it. So why, I guess I guess the point there is, why worry when there's nothing you can do? Yeah, and I saw someone in the chat room said they were going to go buy bottled water. And I just want to throw out there that um, the amount of filtration that happens between water sources in your sink is actually way more filtration than what happens to bottled water. Typically, There's a lot of weird regulations with bottled yeah. water, at least in the United States. I don't know outside yes. of the United States, but inside the United mm -hmm. States, bottled water is not filtered to the same level as your sink. So you're actually better off with your sink water. Yep. And it does depend on where you live. I mean, there's, there's places that have lead pipes still, apparently. Like, it's like Well, the, yes, light, lead pipes depends where you are. Yeah, but if you're in a if you're in an area, most areas yeah. in the U.S. at least have lots of filtration in place, and tap water is meant to be great to drink, or at least that's the PR right. PR around drinking water. Well, yes, I mean, it, it according to the technical regulations, higher, yeah, that's how it's supposed to go. But yeah. Yeah. you know. So I'm just I'm just saying bottled water is also an environmental nightmare. So that is not the solution here. It's not actually going to help you from the PFAS at all. And, and that so, uh, and that so rainwater other... collection barrel, though, that is going to be you know it, it, if it's all you've got, mm -hmm. that's all you've got. So, but it's yeah. So it's but it's unsafe to drink, and and a part of this unsafe to drink, there it is a kind of a little bit of an asterisk there. I have to say. Which is because uh, we used to not have a regulation for it, so drinking water and everything else didn't wasn't even looking at this, and then they realized how horrible it was, and then they created a thing that was like a million parts per whatever lower as the as the back as, as saying here below this is the new guideline, and it was much stricter than the non-existent one, obviously. But by, and we, they had one. And then they lowered the floor on it considerably. So your drinking water is most likely safer than apparently than rainwater, which is crazy. and safer than bottled water. Because as uh, Kevin Reardon is saying in in the chat, isn't the bottle that is used to hold the water containing PFAS? So no, no, it that, is, that, those are, are BPAs. Those are BP no, there's there's what there is not <laughs> there what? is also PFAS in. The uh, the process uh, that's involved, oh, in the, the PFAS, plastic containers BPS. that hold water. So yes, not oh, to mention that man. some reusable items sometimes that have nonstick surfaces also have that. Yep, mm -hmm. yeah, all of it. Oh, so fun forever. The only one I don't think I would give up is the is the lining of candy wrappers because that'd be awful. If every time you opened your candy, it was all like stuck to the side of the packaging. That would be terrible. Is but everything else we should get rid of. <laughs> I don't know what candy you're eating. We, we can debate that one later. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Blair. Yeah. I got. I'm... Is that? What do I smell? No, no. You're clear. What do I you're smell? clear. I was smelling for cancer, but you don't. Don't. You're good. You're good. Okay. Can we? Can you really tell that? Can no. we really tell that? No. But locusts might. This is a study what? from Michigan State University, and they wanted to test the ability for locusts to smell out cancer. Why? <sighs> Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, noses are still considered in many ways the most state-of-the-art, reactive, responsive, sensitive gas sensing equipment we have. And this is related to a conversation we had. Um, I remember Justin was very dubious of the um, COVID-19 oh, sniffing yeah. dogs. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually considered the gold standard, dog sniffing for drugs, explosives, health conditions like low blood sugar and COVID, those are considered better than the machinery we have. And so that is why oftentimes when researchers are trying to find new research to sense gases, they turn to animals first. So this is, I, I will say this is a, um, a pre-publication. This has not yet been peer-reviewed. It's from BioArchive. Uh, it's preprint, um, but they wanted to look at locusts because uh, they are one of the model organisms for olfaction. 
They also use fruit flies a lot, but fruit Ooh. flies are a lot less hardy. And so um, they research have built up researchers have built up a really meaningful understanding of the olfactory sensors in locusts along with their neural circuits. And so from there, they were able to attach electrodes because they're bigger and more rugged. So they were able to attach electrodes to locust brains. They recorded the insect's responses to gas samples produced by health cells and cancer cells, and then used those signals to create chemical profiles of different cells. They also were able to find, so this is the difference between cancer and not cancer, but they were also able to find a difference between different lines of cancer, different <sighs> types of cancer based on this sensor. Wow. And so they were, they were looking specifically at mouth cancers, which means the, um, the chemical signers, signatures of these cancers do get aerated. So you could actually have this sensor developed from the same mechanics in a locust brain and have somebody do like a breathalyzer test to see if they have cancer in their system. Wow. They do think that this is potentially a, uh, able to be used for cancers outside of the mouth because there are still a lot of cancers that introduce volatile metabolites into the breath. So they think that this could turn into something pretty cool. Um, so the the reason this is so important is that like we find out about cancers often really late in the process. When cancer is caught early on, first stage, patients in general have an 80 to 90% chance of survival. But if it's caught in stage four, 10 to 20%. So early detection is key, but without an easy way to detect just like blanket, like is there cancer on your breath or not? Great, let's figure out what kind you have and deal with it right away. This could potentially have a really easy way. You just go into the doctor for your checkup, you breathe into a little tube, and it tells you if you're carrying cancer metabolites in your breath. So it's, you know, I think it is a very cool prospect. Um, they think that it would outpace the speed, sensitivity, and specificity of their current old-fashioned olfaction mechanisms that they use. And so, um, no, you will not have to breathe at a locust in the doctor's office. <laughs> Darn it. Dr. Locust. Yeah. No. That's Yeah, amazing. go ahead. You had a question, Justin? No, no. No, I don't have a question. I just, I'm oh, okay. just amazed by that story. Yeah. Yeah. I think it go. makes a lot of sense with the specificity of insects like locusts slash, slash grasshoppers to uh, chemical signals in the environment. Pheromones mm -hmm. from other locusts that they tune into to, that call them basically to uh, you know, ravage wheat fields, come together and eat my pretties. You know, these, uh, the chemicals the pheromones, the olfactory signals that insects are tuned into, their their yeah. tuning is very specific and very high. They're high resolution compared to humans. But that's the sort of thing that, like, the speci uh, specificity they are yeah. <laughs> is, is actually sort of what's uh, amazing about this to me, is yeah. that they're picking up something that, you know, they're not looking at, it's not like, like, I would almost expect this to be more of the trait of a canine. That's, okay, let's pick out the weakest member of the herd. And, hey, that one's probably not mm -hmm. going to run as fast. Or maybe there's a reason we should target that uh, wildebeest or that caribou or whatever. What are the, you know, why why is this resolution possible? And, and uh, locust. Yeah. That's, that's what's kind of wild about it. They have that, you know, it's an off target hit or whatever, but it's still like, incredible. it's still a hit. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, so it appears as though this is, this is basically just proof that th their, their neural circuits can tell the difference. Right. Yeah. So it's, it has to be kind of separated from, they weren't getting um, behavioral changes from locusts based on different stimuli they were, they were using electrodes on a locust to right. see if there was a response based on different stimuli like in a vacuum essentially so so it's basically just could their could their neurons and their sensory system handle it and they can 
But that's that's great because that's all you need to then start to create a non-animal model. A neural network that can mm -hmm. respond in that kind of way through yeah. artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Computers of the future. Be and as Gary, uh, Gary points out in the chat room there, and then you can eat them. So you have less <laughs> red meat at the end right. of the day. Uh, and then yeah. and then yeah oh but then other things that we want to do we want to restore hearing also this does not involve locusts yeah. at all <laughs> just gonna put it out there this story has nothing to do with locusts uh researchers have been trying to figure out how to restore hearing in people who uh who lose their hearing for genetic reasons and uh, a variety of other reasons for many, many years. And a researcher at the Salk Institute in La Jolla uh, is working with the University of Sheffield researchers and have published a paper in Molecular Therapy Methods and Clinical Development about their work using gene therapy to basically introduce a dysfunctional gene uh, or fix a dysfunctional gene called EPS8 in the inner ear that then allows hair cells to be long enough to do the vibrating that they need to do to allow the signal transduction of sound waves to occur. So uh, they have shown previously that lack or uh, a broken gene of uh, EPS8 ends up with these little hairs in the hair cells, otherwise known as stereocilia, that they're really short. And so with really short hairs, you don't get a lot of vibration. And the way that the hair cells work is that in the fluid in the, in, in the ear, the hair cells are embedded, the waves come through and vibrate the tympanum, and then that, that jelly material in the ear vibrates, and the hair cells are supposed to vibrate back and forth too. But if they're really short, they don't get vibrated. And if they don't get vibrated, they don't turn on and they don't transmit a message to the brain to say, hey, we heard something. So uh, they did a whole bunch of studies in mice, but were able to show that they could introduce EPS8 into the uh, genes of the ear in mice using gene therapy. And it uh, allowed the mice to regain their stereo, the, their long and luscious stereo cilia, and that this, the cells seem to be able to uh, regain their abilities after the therapy. So, future research how can EPS 8 work to restore mm -hmm. hearing during different developmental stages? Is it possible to uh, lengthen the therapeutic window of opportunity? So for kids who have genetic disorders that have led to them having a broken protein, a broken gene, uh, how young can you do gene therapy or how, how old can a, can a child be to allow them to continue to keep their hearing and not to lose it? Nice. Yeah. Let's. Yeah, or, let's or, or use potential it. for drug targeting too, because mm -hmm. if you know that a gene isn't producing a thing, you might there might be ways of tricking the body into working around that, or, or you know, uh, doing what the doing what the genes aren't in real time. Yeah. Go body, go, 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 okay. gadget body. Hmm. Woot woot. Hold the ice. Is it time for the story that yeah, I don't want to hear is, about? This is not a story. This is just an update. This is just an update. <laughs> just uh, all bad news at the start of the show from Justin today. <laughs> but I've got, but, but stick around because it's all good news at the end. Like legitimately. Okay. Good. This time. Great. I mean it. I promise. Uh, but yeah, July. This isn't it though. We're not there yet. <laughs> July saw the lowest extent of Antarctic sea ice on record for a month of July since satellite records began 44 years ago. The lowest July ice ever. And it's, uh, according to the European Union's satellite monitoring group, 7% below the last 30-year average. 
So low ice values <sighs> continue to string actually a blow. It wasn't just like, oh, and all of a sudden July was low. It's been the lowest month, a string of lowest below average months every month uh, observed since February. So. Well, this just, is the Anthropocene. In this is a uh, mass extinction. Here well, we it's Antarctica. So if it's less sea ice, does that mean that less ice has fallen off the continent? I'm just trying to look. <laughs> no, <laughs> it just means, <laughs> right. No. <laughs> so, no, no, that's a good point, though. Okay, so that's a good yeah. point. Because there is a differentiation between the sea ice, which is you got this big block of, of ice cap. Yeah. And it's not just that. There's, there is another story that it turns out like a bunch of that's missing. But that's not this story. This story is talking about the ice that forms of the sea and extends right. out and creates these big shelves off yeah. of the sort of off of the, 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 the cap. So how far out that ice has grown uh, or re how far back I suppose it's retracted uh, is it's the low ever. Now the thing that I, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure about, and this is the problem. Uh, Cause I kept, I was looking at this like, well, July, you know, it's a hotter summer. And so of course it's going to push that sea ice back anyway. It's just didn't, you know, grow out. And then, and then at some point it dawned on me that that's not how uh, hemispheres work. Right. Yeah. That, it's the middle of winter. <laughs> this isn't, this isn't, you know, it's not summer. The, the <laughs> peak summer extent of ice is, yeah. didn't go out as far. This is, this is peak winter ice mm -hmm. that didn't go out as far. That's terribler than, than. Yeah. That means the winter in the southern hemisphere is much hotter which is the part that you really would hope, hope you could catch up for you know make catch uh, make up some ice ground from all mm -hmm. of the hot summer that you had with maybe a cold winter but no no this is the this is the least sea ice in a cold period in the last 30 years which isn't that it was it was better before it's that's when we've been monitoring uh, this data. Yeah, which I also just want, I want to mention anyway, when we talk about sea ice, that it's, it's different when you talk about uh, glacier melt. Right. Because sea ice, really the main loss, besides just it's it's not helping keep the the ocean the right temperature, it's it's losing its ability to, to temper the heat of the water, uh, but it's also habitat. It does not really contribute to sea level rise almost at all. So, um, no. the really unlike, unlike the Greenland stories right. that we're hearing about right now. Yes. So, sea ice in the water, it's the same amount of water. It's floating on top as ice. It's in the, oh, it's basically the same. The displacement, it's the whole, you know, science. Anyway, so uh, the, the ice on land, glaciers, when that melts, it rolls off into the ocean. That was water that was kept off the ocean before. So that contributes yeah. to sea level rise. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I, I saw a couple comments but, in the chat about sea level rise. It is a different... And that's issue. a great point. But and so the, the issue you know, is know. that is the sea, the sea ice not being there in, in Antarctica is going to change the reflectance and thus mm -hmm. the, albedo the albedo of the earth. So how, so how much light gets reflected and so how hot we end up staying mm -hmm. as opposed to reflecting and it, heat. But the green, but the Greenland melting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's adding to sea sea level. We don't like right. Greenland. Yeah, and I, and just to, just to give a picture of how much it's adding, like how much that ice is above the the sea level, uh, and 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 how how massive that is. There's areas in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic region that when the ice caps melt aren't going to experience sea level rise. And the reason is because all of the weight of that ice is, is compact, has a compacting effect. And when it melts away, the earth is going to exhale a little bit right at the cap. And so there, there's actually going to be land raising in the Arctic region because the massive amount of weight that that is pushing down from these ice caps would be gone. 
It's land it's a ho. Weird thing in the picture. How squishy the earth actually is yeah. in, some, in, in some way. That's wild. Yeah, that's our squishy <laughs> earth. It's like that's how much earth. Eggs we're talking it's about our stress it's ball. It's melting away. But we're stressing it. Oh okay. gosh. Oh boy. Well, let's keep moving a little bit on this. Uh, you know, our impact on the planet. Um, not necessarily when it. Uh, well, I guess this is all involved in climate change, but also just how we affect the environment generally. Uh, researchers from Oxford have published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, PNAS, uh, their work comparing environmental impacts of meat and meat alternative products like plant-based sausages, burgers, those kinds of things to figure out their environmental impacts. They looked at 57,000 multi-ingredient processed foods. So not just, oh, rice or potatoes, corn. They looked at bread. They looked at products that were found in grocery stores in the UK and Ireland and determined based on all the ingredients and what was reported uh, by the manufacturers of these foods to develop their, their model of how these products are actually impacting the environment and the choices that consumers are making, how those choices are affecting the environment. Mm. Researcher says, uh, Dr. Michael Clark, he was the lead author, said, by estimating the environmental impact of food and drink products in a standardized way, we have taken a significant first step towards providing information that can enable informed decision making. We still need to find how best to communicate this information effectively. Hey, why don't you talk to our podcast? Um, in order to shift behavior towards more sustainable outcomes, but assessing the impact of products is an important first step. So the study... Uh, as you would think, uh, ha has found that very often a lot of uh, meat-based products are more impactful on the environment. Multi-ingredient vegetable fruit-based products are overall less impactful. They had low input, impact store scores. Um, one of the things that seems to go along with that also is that if they're low impact on the environment, they're also usually have higher impact nutritionally. So the processed yeah, foods that people that's get. That's a good ratio. That's a good ratio. You're, oh, the fruits and vegetables and sugar and flour and like soup, salads, breads, and other things like that. They're better for the environment. And they're also better for you. The one thing that did not match this were sugared beverages because just, if you can imagine soft drinks, they're mm. sugar and it's, that's a crop, but it's not really good nutritionally. Might give you a little bit of energy, but then you crash. Mm. Um, but the researchers are hoping that by looking at these specific food types, they can help people start shifting their behaviors towards swapping things like beef for beans. You know, maybe people would do that anyway because they don't want the L-carnitine that'll affect their heart anyway. So there are lots of things uh, that go into people's choices, but uh, they've used a big data research platform at the University of Oxford called FoodDB. That's food database. Uh, it collects and processes data daily on all food and drink products that are available in 12 online supermarkets like I said, in the UK and Ireland. So it's a pretty big database of food and it's only as good as the source of the information. And uh, I don't know if we have anything like this with uh, the uh, the FDA or our USDA because that no, would be really No, you would never get that in the States. They will never allow <laughs> you to peer behind the curtain and see how your food is made. So there is one thing and I'm not- Natural I'm not... ingredients. Oh no, gosh, it's <laughs> Uh, American advertising in food is such a con job. It just, it really is. But, but, and I don't want to sound like I'm trying to advocate uh, for processed foods. However, there is a thing that I've never seen really looked at when we, when we, when I see these sort of, uh, you know, talking about the impact of a food type 
environmentally, uh, which is food waste. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because because if I can put a heavily processed food type thing uh, in my kitchen cabinet and it's still edible a month or two from now, that food waste from that is going to be nothing compared to vegetables, which I'm constantly like... It's almost like yeah, I'm but Justin, in the back that, of my fridge. That it's can is covered in PFAS. It so. is the interior of the can is PFAS. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So well, environmental you know, impact. Got, there you go. Anyway. Yeah. But there, no, but there is like, there's going to be some ratio. And I, and this is also, this is sort of a, almost off the subject. Peeve I've gotten, or a rev, rev, revelation that has hit me uh, living in Denmark. When you buy bread here, it is good for up to a week tops and then it goes bad if you i've had bread sit on a shelf not even refrigerated in the united states that a month and a half later perfectly fine i don't know what bread you're eating justin but that does not happen to my bread (laughs) really my bread lasts a week if i don't put it in the fridge yeah oh wow i'm buying i'm buying like supermarket Plastic wrapped regular, you know, sandwich bread stuff over there. Never had, like, never have bread go bad. Here it happens all like so. Justin, maybe you need some glasses, some better glasses. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. R and R agrees with my result. Thank you. I think the big, the big thing here, though, you're talking about food waste, which is organic. And yes, another big study out this week found that. Lots of methane comes from landfills. Woo, yes. But if we can uh, use a lot of that food waste, compost it, and use it for energy production, uh, that is actually a great way to harness that methane so that it actually goes somewhere useful. Uh, we can yeah. also take a lot of some of those food scraps. Um, you can, I don't know, take a top off of a off of a vegetable and turn it into a vegetable plant there are lots of there are lots of really neat things we can do with food waste i like using all of my all of my scraps to make a veggie broth in the winter when i'm gonna make soups and stews you know so many things you can do but the problem is on the front end on the front end you have all of the uh all of the gas all of the petroleum products that go into supporting the meat industry and uh and that is always going to be more impactful unless they can start figuring out how to do that just using the energy of the sun it's going to be more impactful than the veggies than you that you buy so yeah, making it's... making the vegetarian choices the healthier choices that way is going to be better for the planet in the long run regardless of that food waste on the on the back end yeah i think the the thing that i i would love to see here that's never going to happen is i would love to see uh, a study like this but even in the uk where this study is happening it would be great if they make policy decisions based on that because as someone mentioned in the chat a bit ago there's you know a lot of subsidies towards corn farmers um, so that we can get all of our corn syrup and all this kind of stuff right so if you change your subsidies so you were subsidizing the oh what's this healthy for you and also better for the environment stuff that would be really beneficial farmers would start switching their crops over to these more subsidized things those things would be more prevalent so it's it would be great if if this could if policy could follow this science that's all i'm saying I'm not holding my breath, yeah, oh. but it would be nice. Oh, policy, science based policy. What? Oh, 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 Just add it to the list, is all I'm saying. Just oh, add you it. idealist. Just a little tiny, or a little tiny, tiny bit of that this week. Yeah. A little tiny yes. bit of that this week, yes, right? We with really the, uh, That's so with crazy. the chip, I... chips passage, right? The Senate, House, they're passing the. Oh my Our Inflation Reduction Act, which actually is going to impact climate change positively mm-hmm. it's good these things come together in good pass in good packages and uh i'm so excited it's you know not the extreme that we would really really hope for but it's something it's progress well, nothing. what good. you're calling so, an extreme i think it would have to call the bare minimum of what we should be doing but yeah <laughs> extreme we can call it extreme trying to save the planet sure Ooh. climate climate experts are celebrating this as a win as we all should <gasps> oh my goodness this 
is This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us for another episode filled with science news and discussion and so many tidbits of fun. If you enjoy the show, please share it with a friend today. Let's come on back. Justin, I think you had a single COVID story for this hour. You want to jump through that hoop? Uh, yeah, this is scientists at Scripps uh, Research. Uh, they, were, uh, identi- they identified antibodies that are effective against a whole host of sars covid 2 variants as well as other SARS viruses. They published this in the Science Translational Medicine Journal. Findings reveal the antibody structures that produce this more comprehensive immune response. Uh, So unlike the game of whack-a-mole that we've been playing with these these virants and their spike proteins, and I think we should probably pause there to explain uh, to the audience what whack-a-mole is. Uh, If you're not familiar with whack-a-mole, there's nothing I can actually say that would properly describe it. You're going to have, it's one of those things you're going to have to Google a video if you're not familiar with whack-a-mole, because you're going, the analogy is going to come up in life. And it's, the analogy is more useful than the, the game of whack-a-mole ever was. It is, is used more often than there were machines of whack-a-mole. Uh, and there's no, the reason people still refer to whack-a-mole in analogies of things is it's the only thing that describes what it is like building a vaccine to attack a spike protein only to have a new variant pop up with a different spike, meaning the antibody is ineffective against that one. And then you, you create, then you alter it to attack that spike protein and it's mutated to have a different one. Kinda I think, like I think, I think the is. thing about whack-a-mole though, is that it's random. You can never guess which mole is going to pop up. Right. And, and that is the important part of that analogy is that yeah. it's really hard to anticipate. Yes. Yes. It's just like a game of whack-a-mole. Pete. See? It's the analogy that's needed to describe the, the game itself. That's why you just have to, if you don't know what whack-a-mole is, you just have to look it up. But these new, uh, okay, so these newly discovered antibodies recognize a viral spike region that uh, hasn't really been targeted by the human immune system previously, and it looks to be much more conserved across the many different SARS viruses. So it's something that uh, is perhaps more fundamental to the function of these viruses, therefore less likely to change as new variants pop up as mutations take place. And this is quoting Dr. Reyes and Drabi, PhD investigator, Department of Immunology and Microbiology. If we can design vaccines that elicit the similar broad responses that we've seen in this study, these treatments can enable broader protection against the virus and variants of concern. So this was this would kind of be the, the silver bullet. Problem is that this is a region that hasn't been targeted by human antibodies, and and it's possible that we don't have the genes to create the antibodies that target this as of yet, because we discovered these genes in macaques. They were actually doing uh, an antibody antibody study in macaques to to test out uh, vaccine, giving them a couple of dose, sort of simulating what happens in humans. But they were able to tackle these variants because they themselves are producing an immune response that targets this this conserved region. So studying the effects of vaccine in macaques may not tell us how human immune systems would react because the, you know, monkeys are genetically different than humans, but that difference uh, could be the key to building a better vaccine as they seem to have a, they seem to have the, the right gene combination to create the right antibody to attack the broad field of the SARS virus. I think this that. kind of research is absolutely necessary. I mean, we need to figure out how to move forward so that, like you said, the whack a mole isn't happening. And as Blair pointed out, the randomness. We actually can anticipate, so we actually know where those mutations are going to be, so that we can, and we can just go broad sweep 
whoop antibody. And I think we talked about it last year, but also a paper came out finally in Nature Communications this week, uh, reiterating and reporting the fact that some 66,000 people a year in Southeast Asia are infected by SARS variety viruses. Yeah. There, and so spillover events are going to happen um, and they're going to happen potentially more and more often with human interaction with animals, with climate change, with all these things. So um, one antibody to rule them all. Yes. Southeast Asia is a, is, a, is a perfect location for viruses to get into and spread amongst the humans because the climate uh, doesn't have a, a hard cold spell that uh, makes things dormant. And it uh, high density of human population. Uh, so it's, you know, that's where, that's where most of the humans are. If you were to just say, okay, just based on the numbers, where are the humans on the earth? We're in Southeast Asia. That's where we live. I don't know. Aside from the volcanoes, I really, really think I need to move to Iceland. It's usually colder there. The, I mean, they've had the viruses, but they have fewer parasites. Everything's a lot nicer there, except for the cold and the rain and the, the, the volcanoes. And I don't know. How far north can you go with climate change making all the north hot, Blair? How far north I can mean, we go? How about off the planet? <laughs> <laughs> Just build a biodome. You're set. That's right. I'll stay there forever. On that note, for biology time, bum, 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 it is time for that part of the show that we know and love. It's Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair? She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a boat What you got, Blair? <gasps> hey, do spiders sleep? What do you think? Never. Never. That's how they keep falling just... into people's mouths when they're, when they're sleeping. They're, they're just alive. around. With... And then they die, right? Okay. Rough. Uh, maybe is actually the answer. <laughs> um, this is a study uh, where some researchers put cameras on baby jumping spiders at night to see if they slept. The footage showed patterns that looked a lot like standard sleep cycles. The spider's legs twitched and parts of their eyes flickered. This appeared to be a REM sleep-like state. And as we know, REM or rapid eye movement is an active phase of sleep when parts of the brain light up with activity and is closely linked with dreaming. Birds and mammals have been shown to experience REM sleep, but it's really hard to figure out with little creepy crawlies if they're dreaming or not. Um, because for one, a lot of them have fixed eyes. So you can't see rapid eye movement if there's no eye movement at all. Oh. For another, oh, wait. So, they have little so blob spiders brains. have to turn their heads to, to see? No, in fact, uh, jumping spiders in particular have eye movement. They can move their retinas around to change their gaze when they hunt. So they were able to observe rapid eye movement or something that looked kind of like that in these spiders. They also have a see-through layer on their on uh, outer layer that gives a clear window into their body so they could kind of see what was going on internally with them as well. Um, they found, they had these jumping spiders in a lab already um, and, and found that um, the, the spiders at night would hang from threads of silk in their lab containers and just chill for a really long time. This is at University of Constance in Germany. And so from there, the one of the researchers in lab was like, you think that spider's dreaming? Which I guess is exactly what you would do if you were a researcher in a lab super late at night surrounded by spiders. I imagine like half the lights off because a lot of the researchers have gone home, right? You're stuck there. You're, you're plugging through some data. 
You look to your side, you see a baby jumping spider just suspended from the top of their cage, just really looks like they're snoozing. It's no, well, time to I've, do some I've research. Seen, I see spiders like that and I think they're they're dead. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Don't don't spiders end up just hanging from a piece of web all curled their arm their arms, their legs curled up mm-hmm. inward when they die. Yeah. And I, as we found out from our spider claw a couple of weeks ago, they do that because they're hydraulic. So that also means that if they're in rest, they're going to be curled up mm. because of the hydraulics of the legs. So if, they're, if their brain is turned off, then that is the position that they should be in. Um, the, the researchers also said that just observationally, it looked a lot like REM sleep in dogs or cats, the way that they twitched a little bit when they were in this state. And then it happened in regular cycles, very similar to sleep patterns in humans. So all that to say, do we know if they're technically sleeping? I would say it's, it all depends on how you define it, but I doubt that they are having the complex rapid eye movement that birds and mammals experience simply because they have this blob brain that is not, it is not quite the complex network that we have. So um, it's possible, but I think it's, it's likely not as, not as complex as what we experience. would be my personal guess. I don't know because also my, part of sleep is like long-term memory storage and all this other stuff yeah. that we actually know um, invertebrates can do. So there's an argument to be made the other way, but there needs to be more testing to figure out whether um, whether they're fully out, whether they respond to triggers slowly or not at all while they're asleep, asleep, quote unquote. And I don't, they have to find a way to scan a spider brain for for sleep activity. <laughs> yeah i got a very high resolution scanner to do that one um so we know that even yeast have circadian rhythms so Mm -hmm. there is this idea of the need for sleep that goes across all taxa of Mm -hmm. the uh, animal kingdom right so sleep yes maybe they do sleep is it rem sleep that they are Really experiencing where they're dreaming, where they're practicing their their neurons. I mean, maybe with the neurons, even though it's just a ganglion, a ganglion, and not a complex brain, perhaps the neurons still need to practice their connections with one another to allow for mm-hmm. better learning. We know that jumping yeah. spiders do have a certain amount of learning and memory and behaviors that last them into the future so i actually would be on team rem sleep hmm, the jumping very spider. interesting yeah. I, I i concur with that kiki i think there's the fundamental thing that dreams do and humans get all bogged down with having this big complicated brain that has all this well i think what my, dream my meant dreams something, mean blah, blah. <laughs> but the function is to you know while you're doing that is yeah you're locking in memory or you're maybe uh, running through scenarios and strategizing so that the the if a fly does hit the <laughs> the web today you've been thinking about it so i think spiders are probably dreaming about flies getting stuck in their web and 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 that sort of in a form of mental practice for the event also also i uh, would predict or that ballooning. flies also dream about getting stuck in webs very different dreams depending yeah. on which which spring one is one is an ex, one's a happy dream one's a nightmare but uh yeah i, I think there's well let, let me ask you this justin do you think that necrobiotic spiders dream of electric flies Ooh, that's a good one. yes of course <laughs> anyway all the time now we're really starting to delve that's into the very couple. very edges of philosophy and consciousness yeah. and that's the that's Ooh, the name of goodness. the novel that inspired the film web runner just so you know so it's anyway i haven't heard of any of it somebody well, out man. there got it anyway um <laughs> next i want to talk about rat sperm okay but it's not where you expect it it's inside a mouse wait what uh-huh, uh-huh. so researchers have generated rat sperm cells inside sterile mice 
Oh. Using a technique called blastocyst complementation. The idea is you can use pluripotent stem cells to create a chimera, a rat mouse chimera. Mm -hmm. I have to find my the exact language because it's it's a domino effect that uh, it's wild. So okay, so normally pluripotent stem cells can be used to make gametes um, in the form of eggs or sperm. It's really hard to do, but it can be done. Most of the time, pluripotent stem cells are often used to create um, rat organs in mice. But the idea of making a rat gamete inside a mouse, so taking those two areas of pluripotent stem cell research and putting them together has not been done. So they wanted to see if they could do this. They injected rats, uh, sorry, they injected rat pluripotent stem cells into mouse embryos to produce a mouse rat chimera. An essential gene for sperm production was mutated in the mouse blastocysts. So that's step two. The rat stem cells developed together with the mouse cells, generating a chimeric animal composed of genotypes from the two species. So we have a rat mouse chimera. A consequence of the genetic sterility in inducing mutation was that the testes were an empty niche. They huh. didn't, they were sterile. They didn't create mouse sperm. Then rat cells could colonize the testes, generating rat sperm in mouse rat chimeras. What? So it's basically, it's, it's the combination of making these chimeras and manipulating very specific genes yeah. to create basically like a vacuum. <sighs> Inside that, not physically, but like, like a, yeah. like a power vacuum almost, right? Like, like I, I have testes with, with no sperm inside. Uh oh. So like, what can I, what do I got in here? Oh, oh, rat sperm. So like rat sperm can fill that space. Basically. Okay. So. So what are the, what are the implications for like, uh, endangered animals and respeciation? That's exactly stuff? it. Yes. So, um, before we get there though, this. Oh proved that this could happen but the sperm cells were able to fertilize egg cells but yeah. they didn't develop normally they did not give rise to living offspring so uh, okay. this per this piece worked but it did not work to fruition yet and very importantly somebody says at the very end of this release one still needs to showcase the production of female reproductive cells, i.e. eggs, in female sterile mice, especially if we envision utilizing this technology for species conservation efforts. So they were able to make sperm. But without an egg, you're... That's the point. You're up an oviduct, oviduct without a paddle. <laughs> is that what say? <laughs> As anyway, the old saying goes. Yes. So they definitely... This, that needs to be figured out. Before yeah. this means anything. However, the idea here is that that means a sterile animal could be a host for the generation of germ cells from other animal species, which means they could be utilized to produce endangered animal species gametes inside prevalent animals, like a super endangered rodent inside a mouse. and Or a um, woolly mammoth inside an elephant. Right. But or what right they're now. really excited about, as researchers often are, is human medicine. So yeah. they might be able to use this to produce rat transgenic models for biomedical research. So they can use the 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 same methods to create the the perfect specimen for medical research this way. <laughs> so. That the perfect specimen that just has this <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so first they have to there. they have to make an well, so I guess first they're gonna try to see if they can get these sperm to work with eggs. And right. then they're gonna try to get a to find a way to make eggs, which like that's a, sorry, a different that's story. Insanely more difficult in a lot yeah. of ways. Like male mammals are churning out sperm constantly. Females not so much. It's a very specific event. So 
it's it's tough but but it's still it's really exciting of course for medical research but i got very excited because i was thinking immediately not about woolly mammoths but about rhinos yeah. yeah, And the fact that there are rhino species that are on the verge of extinction, and you might have female rhinos, but not male rhinos of the right species. You could get the right subspecies or species of rhino to, um, to produce the right sperm based on a seed vault, essentially. And mm-hmm. then you could naturally, they could inseminate um, the female of the correct species, right? So... Mm-hmm. There, I think that is likely to come to fruition before any of these other already extinct animals get figured out, but um, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. If you've got the female of a species still mm-hmm. living, but not the male then, or a limited number of males, then that could mm-hmm. be the, the answer to that problem. Yeah. It can also prevent inbreeding and reduce genetic diversity if you have some mm-hmm. sperm in storage, basically. Yeah. I wonder what the, so here, mice and rats, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're genetically very distinct, mm-hmm. but the fact that you could, that they were able to make these chimeras and it worked fairly well. Now I'm wondering, you know, what, you know, what the distance could actually be between species for creating the chimeras successfully mm-hmm. and having the sperm work in this kind of manner, um, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not Dr. Eviling it here, really, but, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's an interesting question, knowing what we know about human pig chimeras mm-hmm. and, yeah. uh, and, you know, other primates even, you know, what, yeah. could, it's, uh, what could be done? Yeah. It's actually uh, always somewhat fascinating to me that uh, there's not, that, 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 it, that, that it, there is such a fall off between different species being able to to mingle and, and create a viable offspring because you would think one of the more conserved areas of biology would be reproduction but of course it's also that thing that needs you know the the output of that needs to change so much depending on the environment that it's you know evolved to to inhabit that it's, it is both, I think, probably a very conserved and maybe it's just the output, the thing that it, you're making mm-hmm. that is, that's causing the, the, the confluence of too many genes trying to do the same thing or, you know, anyway. Yeah. It's, I was also thinking about if this had, if they could take a step back, if this could be used in endangered species, if again, you have, if you have a reduced uh, genetic diversity, could you take the species difference away and use the same method to create a genetically distinct version of the same species. Right. Mm. And then, of course, I started thinking, about, I don't know if any of you have ever watched the cartoon show uh, Batman Beyond, but there's a whole storyline where um, <laughs> basically somebody gets injected with Bruce Wayne's DNA. And so he fathers a child through this other person and he doesn't know about it. <laughs> And it's basically this. Wow! <laughs> like, Whoa! They really... or there are so, that's the story he told. No, no, you're that was a the billionaire whole, that was the whole with deal. a PR firm behind you. you <laughs> oh, well, I see, honey, what happened was. Well, anyway, there might be some scientific basis for this in the future. Well, and this all can lead to wonderful pop culture and science fiction writing for our future <laughs> that's also entertainment. True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is this week in science thank you so much for joining us for another episode if you are enjoying the show please head over to twist.org today and click on our patreon link and help support the show you are a part of keeping this show going and we really can't do this without you thank you for your support all right justin do you have some really good news like really really good news well, I did promise in the first half of the show that the, my did. last, the final half, uh, would be would be some good news. And so here we go. All the bad things going on, on the planet. Forget about it. <clears throat> uh, we humans occasionally do make an effort to 
move things in the general direction of not being as terrible as we have been in the past. The president of the United States signed an executive order announcing that his America the Beautiful plan, this was something signed a while ago, would conserve 30% of U.S. land and water by 2030. Scientists noticed that policy sounded pretty good, and they, they thought, hey, why don't we throw some science behind that and give some suggestions? So they uh, in the, uh, put an article out in Bioscience, a proposal for uh, West, to w sort of rewilding the Western network, comprising of 11 large reserve areas already owned by the federal government. The authors advocate for the secession of livestock grazing on some federal lands, coupled with the restoration of some keystone species. Specifically, they are focused on the gray wolf and the North American beaver. And there have been examples of the past. They're not just sort of pulling a wishful thing. There have been places where wolf and beaver populations have been uh, brought back, and the effects on the, the biome there have been fantastic. So you've got wolves and beavers produce broad ecosystem effects, according to the article. For instance, they say by felling trees and shrubs and building dams, beavers enrich fish habitat, increase water and sentiment, sediment uh, retention, maintain water flows during droughts, provide wet fire breaks, which reduces the spread of wildfires, improves water quality, except for PFAS, which they can't even get rid of, Increase carbon sequor, uh, sequor state. Oh, I can't talk today. Sequestration and generally enhance the habitat for many plants and animal species when the beavers are reintroduced. Wolves also have a potential to reshape ecosystems. They keep deer populations from overpopulating, which is an interesting side note. But even though Americans own more guns and more guns every year, less people hunt. There's millions of less hunters than there were just uh, 20 years ago. People, people don't really participate in hunting anymore. So by keeping deer populations from overpopulating, that allows native vegetation to regrow. They've found that foresting, uh, forests tend to bounce back because whereas deer would normally be grazing the little seedlings that make up the forest, they tend to hide more when there's wolves around and don't go into those open areas where forests are starting to uh, to push their way out with new seedlings. Also, uh, in reducing the number of grandmothers uh, needed to visit would help reduce carbons in natural areas. The rewilding plan would produce profound cascading effects, say the authors, and could ultimately benefit many of the 92 threatened and endangered species across nine taxonomic groups, five amphibians, five birds, two crustaceans, 22 fishes, 39 flowering plants, five insects, 11 mammals, one reptile, and three, uh-oh, make it two snail species that are currently endangered. Livestock, they say, would have to and move the along, a little doggy. Meat derived. This is interesting to think that, you know, because we talk, we hear a lot about uh, you'd be reclaiming these Bureau of Land Management, federal land, uh, where cattle have been allowed to graze for free or for, for very little. Meat derived from uh, foraging on federal lands only accounts for 2% of the nation's production of, of uh, meat in the first place. So <laughs> it's actually not as nearly as big as I would have guessed it to be. And then there's another story uh, out this week we were talking about, which is along the same, the same vein in reclaiming nature for, for nature in the news. Bureau of Land Management, again, has granted a request by a nonprofit. Now, this is, I was talking about in the disclaimer, find a nonprofit, put some time and effort into it, uh, throw them some money or give them your expertise or just donate your, uh, your hours on the earth to helping them with the cause. This is a nonprofit called American Prairie, which has a herd of bison that it is returning to the lands. So... The Bureau of Land Management has granted them 24,000 hectares in central Montana, which is actually about the amount of land on fire in France right now. Uh, <laughs> a little warming. Oops. Huge fire there. 
Yeah. Uh, make, so, the, but this is the largest land approval the Bureau of Land Management has given to the American Prairie Organization, and many ecologists are celebrating for the first time in their lives. This is quoting ecologist Elizabeth Baker of Netherlands Institute of Ecology. We get a lot of bad news about declines of biodiversity, but then to see these really these things really gives you hope. It makes you think it is possible to restore these ecosystems and give the majestic animals the room they deserve. And she notes that the benefits go beyond bison to a host of prairie plants and other native animals. Ranching groups and state officials are less enthusiastic about the move, fearing the bison will compete with cattle for the almighty tourist dollar. Cattle producers in central Montana fear seeing land they exploited for generations, but never owned nor stewarded, return to the natural state of biodiversity in which they were originally uh, found. So according to BLM, there's actually plenty of land in Montana for both nature and cattle ranching. It's land as far as the can see. American Prairie but, aims to... Go ahead. But, but I, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, cattle tourism? Is that a thing? Yeah, I was surprised. No, that. no, no, it is not. That was something I made up. But I'm like, well, of course, of course they're like, of course they're upset. They've got a, a free meal ticket for this land yeah. that their cattle can graze on that they don't have to do and anything the, uh, for. Right. Uh, and the bison might compete for the resources because mm -hmm. the bison are also grazers. Are using I mean, some I, of that land that yeah, they would yeah, normally yeah. be okay. able to free graze cattle. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was like... <laughs> I try to let that one go by, but I'm glad you caught it. Because yeah, like that go by. oh, the local, the local organizations in there in Central. I'm pretty sure cows look about... very similar in different states. Yeah, that they're freeway you're the on. Economy. Oh, look, more cows. That's yeah. great. Okay. Well, the sort of joke there is that they, you know, obviously they are worried about a very specific self-interest pocketbook of themselves profiting from this, yeah. not the actual region of central Montana, yeah. which right. would actually probably benefit if people did go take a tour to see bison mm -hmm. in the natural uh, preserve, natural preserve, as opposed to nobody's driving there to see your cattle uh, <laughs> wandering around, right? So it's, it's in a way, it would be counterintuitive for them to be working against their own yeah. interests, but that's because, uh, the local economy isn't necessarily their mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. It's just their own particular economy. Uh, back in uh, Prairie, these folks seem to be pretty amazing. It, the organization already manages about 180,000 hectares of public and private land, uh, much of it former ranch land, which they now graze around 800 bison. And it's hoping to expand that number to 1,000 now that it has the extra space. They also go on to say grasslands, especially tall grass prairies, are some of the most endangered and least protected ecosystems in the world. They have received very little restoration efforts because, again, cattle farmers aren't doing that. So cattle farm ranchers, I guess you don't grow cattle. Some, former prairie, uh, some of the former prairies are difficult to restore farmland. Very difficult to get back to natural, pristine uh, uh, places. Uh, but the, but cattle, uh, grazing lands, the open lands that have just been used for cattle to wander around and graze on, apparently that's a much easier change. So that's what they've been, that's the land that they've been focusing on. So rewilding, reintroducing, proposal to reintroduce wolves and beavers to get the ecosystem looking good and bison coming back. I, you know, 30% of U.S. wildland being dedicated to nature again. Sounds like it I hope be. this all happens. Yeah. 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 seldom is heard a discouraging just in, word. Thank you for not calling them buffalo. <laughs> they're not buffalo. They're bison. No. This yeah. is, so I, I always have this question, and I don't know it's a deficit of my memory. It's a separate thing. They're different species. It is a separate thing. Because buffalo every time live in I'm Africa. talking about bison. Yeah. Call them bison. It's perfect. So okay, but so the American it's always been buffalo, bison. It's always been on, bison. Hang on, the thing that we've been calling buffaloes in America is bisons. The buffaloes didn't go extinct, and now all we have is their cousin. The there bison. were never buffalo in America. There were never buffalo. They were called but, bison. 
Yeah, but yeah. it's like, yeah. You know, it's a like lot koala bear. It. it is a misnomer. You need to get rid of it. They said it because they looked like buffalo in Africa. They are not related. Buffalo live in hamburger, Africa. Yeah, hamburgers Bison don't have hamburgers. I can, but I can. The U.S. But I think the weird thing is because of this information that you've given me, for somewhere along the line, I thought the American buffalo went extinct. But its cousin, which is different, the bison, still managed to survive. No. But if you no, tell no. me, we we did a good job at killing off the bison. For I mean, we did a really yeah. good job. We just didn't quite. Get it. There's still some left. Yeah. Cousins, big mm-hmm. bisons, mm-hmm. big bison. Oh yeah. Oh, you know what? You know what? Help me remember it. Good old bison bills traveling western show. Yeah, yeah there you go. The... There Perfect. you go, bison bill. <sighs> Well, beyond Buffalo, uh, I mean, this this episode's focused a lot on the environment and how how we are affecting the environment, climate change, and all these kinds of things. Well, we've heard, I think, last week or so, there was news floating around that all the turtles in Florida are becoming female because of hotter temperatures mm-hmm. and climate change. Well, this week, it's not turtles. Lizards are in trouble as a result of climate change. A new study published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, have determined that lizards, which bear live young in hotter environments, are giving birth to offspring with shorter telomeres. So from the point of birth, the baby lizards are older genetically so the telomeres we've talked about before blair you know we love the telomeres we want them to be nice and happy and long Mm -hmm. and as you get older your telomeres little end caps little on the Mm -hmm. like on the ends of the shoelaces they get shortened and shortened and shortened and shortened every time that your cells divide those telomeres get broken down, especially once tel- telomerase, the enzyme that protects the telomeres, stops working. Well, the hot temperatures these researchers uh, determined, they, uh, they focused on 10 populations of common lizards, Zotica vivipara, also known as the viviparous lizard, which means that they give birth to live young. They live throughout the massive central mountains in France. And they looked over these uh, the period of the study, looking at blood and tissue samples from hundreds of individuals, finding that those in hotter places had babies with shorter telomeres. And based on the extent of the damage it's unlikely that many of those individuals would live long enough to reproduce. That is the killer. That is the killer. That's the species killer. Yes. And that is the species killer. So the researchers suggest that there are actually uh, there during the course of the study, there was one particular population in the warmest area, an area around Mount Mont Caru in France, that it disappeared entirely, and uh, the researchers are calling it uh, what in scientific terminology is pseudo-extinct. That doesn't mean that it's like fake extinct. It means that a species went extinct while its related daughter species, other lineages that were related to it, actually continue living on. So there's kind of like a hole in the phylogeny. Um, Yeah, the researchers say it's something that's happening at a very, very rapid pace so hey thanks climate change and hot temperatures you're making babies with old cells that can't live long enough to have other babies (sighs) i thought we were going to show the good news all right all right all right good good news good news good news okay um right blair yes i learned from big brown bats how you can live longer Yes, give me. Okay, big brown bats live longer because they hibernate. And because they hibernate, they have slower epigenetic changes. So while we're alive, we experience lots of stuff and there's lots of 
uh, mutations that occur, little shifts that happen, and markers, methylations on our DNA that uh, tie things up and make them make it make them harder or easier to turn into proteins, depending on the on the gene that we're talking about. But epigenetic changes lead to faster aging. And if you want to not age as fast, you don't want as much epigenetic changes going on while you're living. Well, anyway, ep ep he's Eptizicus, there we go, Eptizicus fuscus, the big brown bat, uh, lives longer with fewer epigenetic changes because of hibernation. Hibernation slows its metabolism and allows it to live longer. So Blair, if you want to live longer, you need to hibernate. Well, I don't think my work will let me do that. <laughs> Maybe we can start working for it. It's not just the four-day work week, it's hibernation season. Yeah, just like teachers, it. right? I really, I gotta go into torpor. See you all in six to eight weeks. That's it. Oh, <laughs> I think. Man. I mean, the Europeans already have it right. They take a month off in the summer. It's perfect. Hold my calls. I'm not answering my emails. Huh. We're not coming back. Um, and finally, 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 let's talk about sleep because it's the end of the show, and I know I don't want to put anybody to sleep, but. Researchers looking at brains are very interested in how brains fall asleep. And so um, some researchers that recently published, again, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, they paired fMRI research with EEG research. So they got the electrical activity of the brain also, at the same time that they were getting the uh, the blood flow in the brain, which is a proxy for neuronal activation, and they were able to use these two different kinds of imaging to really get a good resolution view, space and time of how neurons, or well, not, not specific neurons, but areas of the brain were active during falling asleep. I mean, it's a little weird. They put people in fMRI machines wearing EEG caps and said, hey, oh. take a nap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. The hum of that machine, though, it's just, yeah. oh, it's perfect. Oh, yeah, I can, I can do it right away. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Yeah, yeah just, just so comfortable and cozy. I'd probably have to stay awake for three days ahead of time to fall asleep in one of those machines. But the people who did there might be, that's what I'm, I'm pointing out, is there could be a, conf a confounding factor mm -hmm. that people were sleeping in these machines, so it yeah. could affect the way that the sleep occurred. But what the researchers were able to determine were specific populations of neurons and the order in which they were falling or becoming inactive or less active during the stages of sleep. And so the researchers determined that uh, area, that while you're falling asleep, that initially drifting off to sleep, the thalamus is the first region to show sleep-associated blood flow patterns. And this also kind of fits in with lots of other research that the thalamus and our emotions and all that kind of stuff and the basal brain areas um, are kind of the first thing to get tired and start putting everything to, to sleep. Um, but... Interestingly, that was not the area of the brain that woke up first. So the areas of the brain that woke up first were the frontal cortical regions of the brain, which are associated with attention mm -hmm. and, um, and, and cognitive activity. Well, this is like going to keep you from getting attacked just... in your sleep, right? Like that's the first thing that has to, has to happen if you've got to wake up quickly to protect yourself. Right, no, which leads thing, to if, if there's people a line in my punching other people. <laughs> There's a, my, yeah. there's a lion in my apartment. First thing I need to do is go find coffee so I can be awake enough to handle it. I think it's just, a, right. I, I mean, well, I that, that's a wait. chemical dependency. That's a confounding <laughs> variable for sure. But it's, but it's to, to, uh, to, but it's tied to attention, right? I mean, yeah, it's it is, like, yes, it's, tied to yeah, attention yeah. and cognitive processing. But so yeah. it's going to be very interesting. As you first wake up, I imagine that instead of being just emotionally, you know, mm -hmm. responsive, you want to be more aware, like you said, Blair, of what's around. So, Justin, is there coffee? 
has the coffee machine started yet? Yes. Is it worth getting out of bed right now? Right. You know, so you have those realizations first, or, you know, is there an intruder in the house? Am I sleeping in a big fMRI machine? Yes. You know, what's, what's yeah. going what's on sound? around me? Yeah. Am I so stuck? That awareness becomes the attention, the awareness, the processing starts, and then the emotional stuff uh -huh. will come in later, you know, as the, as the brain wakes up. Uh, I'm wondering it's interesting if, that it's backwards. If on the other side, if because the emotional stuff is the first to go to sleep, if that's why, if you're stressed, if you're anxious, if you're upset, if you're you even really happy and amped, yeah, you like you can't go to sleep. It's it's like it's the gatekeeper almost if it has right. to go to go to sleep first. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, calm the basal brain. Yeah. Calm that down. Use your cognitive processing mm -hmm. to slow the basal brain. Then the basal brain can calm down and allow the rest of the brain to fall asleep. This mm -hmm. is making a lot of sense. This is so, where you fall so asleep this, during meditation. Is because you're or like, math class, <laughs> <laughs> but not during twists. But never math class, twist. I get excited. Oh, let me solve that equation. <laughs> I love you. That's <laughs> The best. Thank you for the whiteboard. <laughs> I know the answer to that question. Oh, <laughs> I miss math class. Have we done it? Yes. Have, have we have we uh, stimulated our frontal cortical regions enough this evening? I think so. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've done it as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of this week in science. We have finished the show and it's time for us to go. So I would like to say thank you to Fada for your help with show notes and social media, helping out with all of those things that you do. Gord, Arn Lore, others. Make sure that the chat rooms are nice places. Thank you for being here and for doing that. Identity Four, who's not here tonight. Thank you for usually recording the show. We really, really need you recording the show, and we appreciate your help doing that. And Rachel, thank you for editing and for all of your other assistance. And thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Ralph E. Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard, Chef Stad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Reagan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Face, Beat It Boat, Beto for Texas, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, aka Z McKen, Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley. Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Deb Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Eric, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, Head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time and another show Thursday at 5 a.m. Central European time. Broadcasting live from our YouTube and our Facebook channels from, from twist.org slash live. That's next Thursday, not tomorrow, right? No. <laughs> yeah. No, no, okay, Thursday, got it. Thursday. I just want to clarify because it's still Wednesday in the United States right now. All right. Anyway, um, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe while you wake up for your day and activate your awareness part of your brain, just search for This Week in Science over podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. You can contact us directly, email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Don't get those suffixes confused. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into a baby jumping spider's dreams. Aww. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Uh-huh. How cute. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, which is the thing where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback if there's a topic you would like us to cover or address. A suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night. Please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week's science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in 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 science.